welcome to today's lesson and it represents the first lesson on industrial chemistry. So for those studying this option, this is um, what we're, where we're going to start with is essentially looking at natural products and because industrial chemistry is all about chemical equilibrium as well, we'll, doing, we'll be doing a quick review in a few lessons time on chemical equilibrium as well. So today's lesson is mainly to do with world resources and also how we use world resources to, as chemists and as well as in society. Because one of the major roles of chemists is to find newer materials or develop new materials that we can use when certain world resources start to decline. So many of our world's natural resources are finite and we know this because we look at things like fossil fuels. We dig them out of the ground much faster than they can be replaced so we can consider them finite. So there's not an infinite supply of them. So we have three examples, oil, coal and minerals. So these two being fossil fuels and we've seen their use, coal for power generation or electricity generation and oil for automotive transport and generally fuel as well. Minerals we're talking about here is to do with um, metals combined with other compounds, uh, other elements. So things like bauxite, which is aluminium oxide, which we mine in Australia to produce pure aluminium, as well as iron ore and various other um, metals that we dig out of the ground are generally found in mineral form. So a natural resource is something that we can derive from resources in nature. And the product that we finally end up with has very little modification compared to when we actually took it from that resource. So for instance, if we look at wood, when we cut down a tree, the wood that we get out is very similar to the wood that was part of the tree. Um, there may be some differences in the shape, um, the, the, the surface as well may be slightly different because we might have planed it down or sanded it to a particular, um, to something that we particularly like. But in general, the structure of the compound is basic, or, of the material is basically the same as when it was a tree. For instance, something like petroleum or crude oil, we take it out and then we refine it with all these different refining processes. So the final end product is very different to the product that we started with. So that we don't really consider as a natural product. So various examples include ivory, so tusks of elephants, which is now, I think, banned in many countries. Gold. so. Obviously, that we know where gold comes from, digging it out of the ground or panning for it in rivers. Silver, again, another precious metal. Vegetable oil, so when we sort of squeeze the oil out of seeds and other things, we get vegetable oil and we can use that for cooking or we can turn that into a fuel later on. Natural rubber, which we'll talk about in a future lesson, I think. Wood, as I mentioned, and wool, which is just here. Okay. So most of these natural resources, barring those metal ones, those precious metals, um, are generally unlimited in the sense that as long as our extraction rate, so the rate at which we use them, doesn't exceed the rate at which they can be produced, then they can gen we can call them unlimited. So wool, wood, and rubber are all examples of these kind of resources. Unlimited, uh, but under the provi uh, provision that we don't use them faster than they can be reproduced. So then, like I said, one of the main goals of a chemist or some, one of the main roles of the chemist is to produce synthetic materials should we need them for something. So when the demand of a natural resource exceeds the supply, we, a resource can be depleted, so then we get synthetic materials instead. So when we have too much demand for something and the natural way of making it can't keep up, we generally resort to synthetic materials. So it's the job of a chemist, or it's one of the many jobs of the chemist, to research these alternatives. So vegetable oil and petroleum oils were used to replace whale oil as the population of whales declined. So as the, the demand for whale oil increased and the population of whales decreased, there wasn't enough whale oil to go around. So now we needed to resort to petroleum and vegetable oils to, to fill that gap. And it's the job of the chemist to figure out what things can actually fill that missing gap. 
Um, another one was synthetic fertilizer. So we can produce our own types of fertilizer um, to, to sort of compensate for the fact that there was a very high demand for fertilizer um, that couldn't be matched by the natural product. So the supply of natural fertilizer, um, bat guano, so the, basically the, the feces of the bat, there was no way it could meet the growing demand of agriculture. So we needed to produce these synthetic fertilizers. So that wraps up today's lesson on natural resources. So we'll look at the question segment and we'll hopefully be able to use some of the things that we've seen here to, to answer these questions. So which of the following is not true of a natural product? So as we go through them, just try to think about what we've just learned in this lesson and hopefully you'll be able to see the answer straight away. A, they are extracted and produce with little to no processing. So this is true in the sense that we get natural products basically unchanged from when we harvested them. So this is not the right answer. They are derived often from plants and animals. Again, many useful natural products are derived from plants and animals, such as rubber and whale oil. So again, this isn't the correct answer. They are renewable, given extraction is less than production. Yes, that's again true, so this isn't the right answer, because as long as the production exceeds demand, these products will always be available. And so D must be the correct answer. They are non-renewable. That's not true unless this condition is met, that the production um, they are renewable given production exceeds demand. So as long as we can keep producing them faster than we can consume them, we can call them renewable. Okay. So moving on to question two, defining a natural product. Well, a natural product is any product derived from resources available in nature with little or no modification. So rubber, wool, all of these things, wood, can all be taken straight out of the environment and basically just turn straight into whatever we want it to. And so we don't modify them very much. And that's what is called a natural product. Okay. Distinguish between renewable and non-renewable resources. So this is something that I study very, very heavily. Um, a renewable resource is any resource which replenishes itself. So um, for instance, wood is a renewable resource. You can cut down a tree and then plant a new one, and it will replenish itself. Solar power technically is not renewable in the sense that we can't, it won't replenish itself, but the time scale is so long that we kind of consider it a renewable resource because it'll be around for so long anyway. Of course, again, under the provision that extraction rates do not exceed production rates, so we always have to remember that we can't exceed the demand. Uh, we, can't exceed the, we can't exceed the production, sorry. The demand can't exceed the production. Um, for example, fish are renewable as long as we don't fish faster than they can breed and grow. So in terms of feeding our population, as long as we can extract the fish slower than the fish can grow and breed, we'll be fine. So a non-renewable resource is obviously one that does not replenish. So coal doesn't replenish itself anywhere near fast enough to be considered a renewable resource. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Explain why, despite the useful products that are derived from whales, whaling was banned in the 1980s. Okay, so um, it's, sun it's suddenly come up in the news again with South Korea hunting whales for scientific purposes. Um, but in 1980, we had a morator moratorium, which is essentially no, a complete ban on whaling. And so why did we do that, even though all this whale oil is very useful? Well. There's a sh there was a sharp decline in the whale population. And obviously, we don't want to cause the extinction of another animal. So we tried to avoid this by stopping it. So there's a sharp decline. We noticed this, that there was not as many whales simply available. Now, despite the usefulness of these materials, um, the, whale, the whaling process was not sustainable. Obviously, if there's a decline in the population, and even if we continue the way we're going, if the, the population is declining, then, of course, it's not sustainable. We need it to also stay constant as well. Therefore, whaling needed to be abandoned in lieu of synthetic materials. So synthetic materials were needed simply to, to replace whaling because there was no way whaling was going to keep up with the demand for whale oil. Okay. So 
Moving on to the last question. Describe three issues associated with shrinking natural resources. So describe is the verb here, and it basically means to, um, to just sketch out in very brief terms. So with shrinking natural resources, the increased costs of resources means equitable access is not possible. So when you have a shrinking resource, obviously the price goes up because there's less of it to go around, assuming the demand stays constant. Now, of course, if the price goes up, it means that poorer people will not be able to afford this resource, whereas richer people will be. So that's what it means by equitable access. Rich people and will still have the advantage, whereas poor people will not. It restricts production to certain areas of the world. So a shrinking natural resource restricts to the most fertile areas. So for instance, oil in the Middle East has lots of oil. So its production is concentrated there. And you can already see the problems with that because some of those countries are led by very unstable governments. So that hampers the supply for other countries as well. That's why there's so much fighting going on just for the sake of oil. And by shrinking the natural resource, it requires alternatives which may not be technologically or economically feasible to be produced. So for instance, fuel, like petrol, we currently don't have an alternative that's really, really good. Um, there is ethanol. Ethanol is good in Brazil. It works quite well. Um, but in Australia, we can't quite get the production at the same rate. And so it's not economically feasible, but it is technologically feasible. Um, for instance, another one would be hydrogen fuel cells. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in California tried to push that really, really hard. Um, not technologically feasible or economically feasible. So again, that doesn't really work. So these alternatives need to be created uh, when we have a shrinking natural resource. Okay, so that wraps up today's lesson on world resources and natural and synthetic materials. So we've learned about what the implications of shrinking world resources are, and what the general, um, how we define natural products, and what the main ones that we use in society are. So in the next lesson, we'll be doing a case study, or several case studies, on replacing natural resources with synthetic materials. And so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.